host, Jojo Mayor. I welcome you all to the free webinar. And we are live now. Welcome again. I welcome you all to this free webinar on Guest Lecture International World Cancer Day, organized by IAO, or the International Association of Oncology, and Scientific Partner, BioLeagues Worldwide, and IDA, or the Indian Dental Association. As a nonprofit, BioLeagues Worldwide is globally recognized professional association that operates under the Technorit Group. It serves to propel and fuel all innovative work of research with immense potential in the fields of healthcare, life sciences, pharmaceutical sciences, and the medical sciences in general. In this capacity, BioLeagues Worldwide has been directly responsible for a significant amount of the revolutionary developments that have taken place in this field over the past few decades. International Association of Oncology is one of the world's leading professional associations for medical oncology and life science professionals caring for people. IAO is a non-profitable professional association meant for research and development in the field of medical oncology and life science. IAO is an international forum for researchers, academicians, doctors, and practitioners for sharing knowledge and innovation in the field of healthcare and life sciences. IAO aims to bring together worldwide researchers and professionals, encourage intellectual development and providing opportunities for network networking and collaboration. IAO delivers access to its members and industry's most essential technology information by organizing conferences workshops, annual convention meetings, and provides network opportunities both locally and globally. Members have the ability to stay current in their chosen profession, connect with peers, and invest in their future. IAO provides a broad-based home for members and societies who are interested in aspects of medical oncology and life sciences together with companies, hospitals, government organizations, pharmaceutical company researchers, and university researchers. About IDA, Indian Dental Association represents dental professionals in India. Established in 1946, the association currently has more than 75,000 members, 450 local branches, 28 state branches, and eight union territory branches, and one defense branch across India. Now I would like to welcome our IDA president, Dr. Arun, to say something about IDA. Welcome, sir. You're on mute. There. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for the wonderful introduction. I'm Dr. A.V. Arun, president of the Indian Dental Association, Chennai Metro Branch. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite and welcome all of you to the Symposium on Cancer Awareness. <coughs> it is done by Indian Dental Association and the International Association for Oncology. Like, as she mentioned in the introduction, the Indian Dental Association, as of now, has not 75,000, but 80,000 members. It's one of the largest dental associations in the world. And uh, it is the premier association for dentists in India. And as dentists, we come up with a lot of patients, especially with oral cancer. And they come to us with various stages of cancer. And most of the time, it's a dentist who's the first person to identify this dental cancer, oral cancer. But unfortunately, there are times when a lot of dentists miss it out also. <clears throat> this is probably because they are not sure 
about the signs and symptoms or the knowledge is not good enough for them to recognize the early stages of cancer or maybe they are not too sure about how to handle it. <clears throat> so um, today we have three excellent speakers. All three of them are specialists in oncology and cancer. Two of them are from India and one from the United Kingdom. And I'm sure all our doubts will be cleared by these speakers. I'm sure this symposium is going to be an eye opener for all of us, and it will help us to expand our knowledge on cancer, its diagnosis, and its management. So thank you very much to the International Association of Oncology for partnering with the Indian Dental Association. And I hope a lot of people will gain a lot from this lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so, so much for our, our IDA president, Dr. Arun. Thank you so much, sir. Next, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. M. R. Veen. He is currently working as a professor and head of department, Savisa Dental College and Hospital Chennai. Good evening, sir. Good evening, doctor. Yeah, I think someone else is sharing the screen. They'll have to. Oh, okay. Oh, that's me. Oh, God. There you go. Yeah. Please. Uh, is my screen visible to everybody in the audience? Not yet. Yes, yes. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. So very good evening to all the participants here. And at the outset, I'd like to thank the Chennai Metro branch of the Indian Dental Association and the International Association of Oncology for having hosted this symposium on World Cancer Day. And as the president of uh, IDA Chennai Metro, Professor Arun had spoken in his introductory remarks, the, the magnitude of oral cancer, what we see, especially in the Asian part of the world, it's something alarming and any dentist, irrespective of whichever specialty you are, uh, play a major role in identifying it at an early stage, initiating the most appropriate treatment and following it up over a long period of time so that the patient is free from the disease burden. So with these few words, I, I go to my topic, which is management guidelines of oral complications of cancer therapy. Uh, am I audible to everyone in the audience? Is the my screen apologies. clear? No, we don't see your screen, sir. I think some people were able to see it. Yeah, I also asked my colleagues if they can see it, but I, I, don't, I don't see it on my end. I'm confused. <laughs> what about the others in the audience are able to see it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. able to see and uh, very clear to the voice also. Okay, thank you. Oh, sir, it's your, uh, your slides are not visible. It's you who is visible. Uh, are, are these oh, standards? okay. Um, doctor is referring to the PowerPoint presentation. Yes, Everyone, yes, if yes. you can see it. Yes, 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 yes. That's what I want. The PowerPoint presentation. Do you see it? Because I don't. <laughs> are, are, are the people in the audience able to see the PowerPoint presentation? No? No, sir. No, no, no. no, no sir. I only see to you, but your PowerPoint presentation is not visible. Only you are visible. To work exclusively on other people. Is it visible now? Can you reshare it again, sir, please? Yeah, is, is my PowerPoint presentation visible? No? No, sir. I have shared the screen.
it's coming it, up is it visible now yeah yeah now yes, it is visible up. now it is visible it is okay. visible now go ahead doctor okay. Okay, so today my topic for the next half an hour or 25 minutes would be the current evidence-based management guidelines of oral complications of cancer therapy. Cancer in the broad sense is a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. If you look at the latest census from the WHO, the latest available data is the 2019-2020. Per year, there are almost 14 million cases of cancer. And out of 14 million cases, there are almost 8.8 .8 million deaths because of cancer, which means one in every sixth death is because of cancer. And out of this cancer, if you look at the, the, the epidemiology or the statistics of oral cancer, it's almost the sixth common cause of deaths amongst all cancer. Per year, we have about almost five lakh cases because of death because of oral cancer. And if you look at oral cancer per se, what is the main reason for it? Tobacco, tobacco, tobacco. 22% of the cancer related deaths and especially oral cancer, it's because of tobacco use. Recently, there is also an increase of about 25 to 26 percent of oral cancer, which is because of infections, especially uh, human papilloma virus and hepatitis virus. Yes, cancer treatment has tremendously improved over the last five or six decades. Again, there is a huge global disparity as far as cancer treatment is concerned. Most of the developed countries have almost 90% of cancer care available to their population. Whereas countries like India or the developing countries are economically slightly uh, not very affluent countries. It's only 30% of their population who have access to advanced oral ca or cancer treatment. A complications in the oral cavity occurs either primarily because of the malignancy per se itself, or it could be as a result of the treatment sequelae, which was initiated for either cancer anywhere in the body or for an oral cancer itself. Most complications occurring in the oral cavity has a profound impact on both the functional and the sensory aspects of the oral mucosa, markedly affecting the quality of the life of the patient. That's what is said in the National Cancer Institute 2016 statement. Here in the present day world, they are looking at a population with increased survival post-cancer who have the natural set of teeth, which is retained for a longer time. But what is the quality of life post, especially the oral care, the oral quality of life, which has a profound impact on the general quality of the life in these patients who survive treatment to cancer. Is the, is the PowerPoint visible now? Yes, sir, visible. Okay. visible. And, and what about the audibility? If that is clear? Fine, it's fine. Very sir. clear. Okay. The guidelines or what usually we oral medicine and oral physician or anybody involved in the oral care of complications or treatment of oral cancer is a three-way path, what we call it in a scientific terminology. A pre-treatment assessment, actual care delivered during cancer treatment to the oral cavity, and the role of the dental team in managing the sequelae or the oral complications which arise post-treatment to cancer care. So first, let us see what the pre-treatment assessment holds for us. 
One point what I want to emphasize to this audience, especially there are a lot of postgraduates in this audience, oral cancer or cancer care is not a single person's job. It's a team effort. It's a multidisciplinary team effort. Cancer, whether it's an oral cancer or cancer anywhere in the body, even if it's not a primarily oral cancer, as part of the oncology protocol, we need an early pretreatment oral assessment. If you go to the WHO website or the International Academy of Oncology, they have something called as an oral assessment form, either a primary oral cancer or cancer anywhere in the body. A member of the team or the oncologist who deals with the case primarily need to fill up the form which has the details about the cancer, the proposed treatment part for the cancer, the medical complications of the, of the patient and refer it to the dentist in that oncology team to assess the oral cavity fully. Once the case comes to the dental team, you need to nominate one member of the dental team who is in, in charge of the comprehensive dental care or oral care of this patient right from before treatment, during treatment, post-treatment and long-term follow-up of the patient. And as I told you, it's always a multi-speciality, multidisciplinary, collaborative care. It requires oral medicine experts. It requires restorative dentists. It requires prosthodontists. It requires pathologists who need to work on this patient in a unison. This is a beautiful article or which summarizes by Kufta et al., which, which was published in the Oral Oncology 2018 January issue. It's an interplay. This, is, this article focuses mainly on uh, patients with oral cancer who, undergo, I mean, who have to undergo radiotherapy. And again, participants in the audience, most of the complications, what we experience in the oral cavity post-treatment to oral cancer is following radiation and chemotherapy or a combination of radio, radiation and chemotherapy. There are not many significant complications directly as a result of surgery. Yes, for oral cavity or oral cancer, surgery is the primary treatment. But 90 to 95% of the cases after surgical would necessarily or mandatorily undergoes a secondary radiotherapy or a chemotherapy. And its complications arise post-RT or post-CT. So this is an interplay between three main domains or factors, the patient factor, the cancer per se, and the dental status. So let's see what the patient factor is. Motivation. So this is what I talked about in the pre-treatment assessment. Member of the dental team or mem member of the oncology team who assesses the patient needs to estimate or make an assessment of his motivational status. How good the patient is keen to maintain his oral hygiene before, during, and post-treatment. If the levels of motivation is not high, he's not going to follow your oral hygiene instructions at different stages. Then you plan the dental treatment for him from being a more restorative or preventive oriented treatment to more a surgical extraction so that he need not spend much effort which is required from a patient to have a good oral prophylaxis or oral hygiene maintenance at different stages of the cancer treatment. And it's here we face a problem. If you look at statistics or evidence-based publications, Almost 50 to 52% of the patients post-treatment for cancer and oral cancer, they get lost down the way in about 6.5 to 7.5 months. They don't come up regularly for the follow-up. And a couple of years later, they come with complications because they have left the, the, the follow-up regime. The second thing is socioeconomic status. It's well clear in the, in the epidemiology what we see. Cancers which are of good prognosis usually is more in the more affluent socioeconomic status. Patients with a lower economy, poor education, lack of awareness, 
they usually come to us with an advanced stage of cancer, a stage three or a stage four, where prognosis is bad. The third point of race or ethnicity, since it's a mixed audience here from people from different parts of the globe, I did include this point. What data suggests is that the prevalence or the, 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 the prognosis of a cancer and its post sequelae survival, it's much higher in a person of a white ethnicity compared to an ethnicity of the black or the African origin. Again, it's from the database, which is available in the WHO website. The successful management of cancer and oral cancer in different stages depends a lot on the support system which the patient has got from his family, from his friends who motivate him to stay positive, assist him during the entire disease and recovery process. Patients who lack this support system from their friends or family lose the battle. They, don't, they get depressed and they come back with complications. Nutrition, a very, very, very important part to assess prognosis or survival of cancer. We have, that's why we need a dietitian as part of the cancer team. If the patient's mean body mass index is less than 22.3 milligram kg per kg per, milli per meter square, then the prognosis is poor. You need to estimate the albumin levels. If it's less than 4.5 grams per deciliter, again, the prognosis is poor. So the nutrition of an individual to sustain the treatment, to overcome the complications, plays a very, very important part. Next is cancer per se, location, cancer of the lip, cancer of the buccal mucosa, cancer of the gingiva have got a very good prognosis. Whereas the cancer on the lateral or the ventral surface of the tongue or the floor of the mouth or posterior into the oropharyngeal or the hypopharynx definitely has got a poor prognosis. What type of radiation are you going to give? Is it a brachytherapy? Is it a teletherapy? But nowadays, most of the, the radiation oncologists prefer a highly specific IMRT or an intensity modulated radiotherapy which has greatly reduced the complications of cancer or the, the, the effects of radiation. Prior to cancer therapy, this is what we as an oral or a dental team, the, the remaining part of my lecture is going to be focused on the dental audience over here. Again, I stress even a primary care dentist in a private practice plays a very, very important role in offering his or his part to treat cancer patients and oral cancer patients. It should be an integrated and extensive oral assessment, assessing the heart tissues, the soft tissues, mandatorily have a lot of radiographs done because clinically you might not have any carious lesions or you feel, or you might think that the bone support is good, the periodontal status is good. But when you take up a radiograph, it's going to give you a different picture either a baseline panoramic or the patient is tolerable, you could do a full mouth radiographic series. Talk to the patient, advise the patient on the potential side effects. Oral hygiene instructions is the most important thing right from the word go of diagnosis till the completion of treatment. Mouthwash with chlorhexidine gluconate, brushing twice a day, Dietary advice. This is where we need to have a talk with the dietitian in the team because the nutritional status of these patients is compromised. So they need to be on high carbohydrate diet or diet which could tend to be cariogenic because to increase their nutritional levels. So we need to talk or have a plan with the dietitian how their nutrition is not compromised. Yet, on the other hand, these uh, carbohydrate rich diet do not change or become cariogenic and complicate the oral cavity or the, or the profile of the oral cavity. A thorough periodontal workup, tooth which cannot be salvaged, have them extracted. Do not go for uh, uh, exhaustive restorative therapy. Caries management, 
you could use glass ionomer cements or resin filled glass ionomer cements trauma removal a very very important part to oral cavity especially from the indian population what we see oral sepsis or sharp tooth is not much reported in the western literature whereas in our asian population without a tobacco habit we have a lot of patients because of persistent chronic trauma and a very very poor oral hygiene or a lot of oral foci of infection so remove those trauma or the sharp tooth or the offending agent and improve the oral hygiene get into the habit of making impressions for these patients before they go for either a surgery or an rt or a ct you could make stents for them so that when they go for rt it acts as a protection to protect the soft tissues and the hard tissues of the oral cavity or you could use them to make trays to give them application of fluoride varnishes to increase the strength of the teeth dentures are a problem for these patients because of the trauma and the erythema which the mucosa is likely to undergo so you need to teach them on good denture maintenance or denture hygiene removing the denture at night time denture maintenance with chlorhexidine gluconate mouthwash or with a sodium hypochlorite mouthwash so you need to teach them on denture hygiene exodontia a very very important part especially the patient is likely to go for an exclusive rt or a surgery has been done but the teeth have been spared so complete all periodontally compromised teeth or teeth will have a periapical pathology don't look at a long term uh, investment look at 2 years 3 years down the line the patient should not develop any complications so have any teeth which cannot last more than 3 months or 6 months after your treatment just go ahead and have them extracted this is an important thing what we need to do which most of us either in a tertiary care or even in a primary care do not do it do we need to have an antibiotic prophylaxis always a controversial topic but the evidence based guidelines suggest that yes do the complete blood picture in fact any patient before a, a, a surgery or an rt or a ct is definitely going to go for a complete blood profiling if there is a neutropenia or the wbc is less than 1000 uh, you definitely need to go for an antibiotic prophylaxis the same american heart association guidelines you go for an, an amoxicillin or a clindamycin or a cefalaxin whichever is suitable to the patient you need to go for the uh the antibiotic prophylaxis for these patients if it's about 200 or 2000 uh, cell count then there is no need for any antibiotic prophylaxis you could just carry on with either your restorative or your exodontia treatments orthodontics is always a question by the orthodontist a patient who is undergoing orthodontic treatment what should be his status it's only one golden rule discontinue the orthodontic treatment and do not continue it for the next 2 or 3 years following treatment of either a primary oral cancer or an hematological malignancy which had a possible oral complications 2 to 3 years post recovery do not venture into any orthodontic treatment so these are the factors again from the same article which have a high risk factor with a poor oral prognosis any radiation about 26 grays to the parotids is going to lead to xerostomia any radiation above 50 to 70 grays to the mandible 80 to 90% of a chance of an osteo radio necrosis always there is a comparison between an imrt to a conventional rt or a three dimensional uh, reformatted uh, or a conformal radiotherapy best thing is to go for an imrt so that the vital structures are spared well the question comes you say assess the prognosis assess the prognosis assess the prognosis 
is there any classification or is there any guideline how you prognostic how, how you do a prognostic evaluation of the tooth status whether you decide to retain the tooth restore the tooth or go ahead and extract the tooth the classification what we as part of the oral oncology or the oncology team is called as the somet classification where we determine or assess the prognosis of the tooth based on these four domains or factors the periodontal health and the alveolar support available how much of tooth structure is available the endodontic status of the patient and what is the position of the tooth or the occlusal plane especially in the path of radiation so these are the four domains and based on these four domains it is classified as a b c d and x a stands for good where you have at least 80 to 100% of bone support 80 to 100% of coronal tooth structure remaining the endodontic status of the tooth is good either a good or previously done rct or even if you do an rct it's going to be of good prognosis the tooth is an occlusal plane so this comes under the a category where there is a very good prognosis or a minimal uh, uh, risk of or chance of the tooth getting lost fair prognosis from 80 to 100% all parameters come between 60 to 80% a low risk of the tooth getting extracted questionable or c from 80 to 100 so it it comes to 30 to support from 60 to 80 it comes from 30 to 60 questionable or moderate risk compromised less than 30 non salvageable a vertical fracture less than 30% or 15% of bone loss you have no other choice other than extracting it so get into the habit of doing a prognostic evaluation of your tooth status prior to venturing into surgery rt or ct grade them as grade each and every tooth as a b c d and x assess those four domains or parameters make an objective scoring and then you take a decision once all these things you start doing into it into your into your oncology practice you can be assured that the long term success rate and the complications are going to be as negligible because people think that cancer you just do a surgery cut it out and throw subject to 50 or 60 a graze of radiation do a four to six cycles of chemotherapy patient is cured no that's only one part of the whole picture what you require is a good pre treatment good during treatment care the most important is post treatment care so so far we have seen the pre treatment care what we as a dental team need to do it post graduates if you are in this audience it's it's a good paper which came in the journal of the american dental association by mike brennan from the north carolina institute of dental sciences uh in the 2018 issue because we say complications complication but there's no high quality paper or evidence base to suggest what actually the needs of these patients so this prospective longitudinal multicentric observational study done in six oncology centers in the dental hospital in six states in us a total of 356 participants were recruited the, the result was 50% of them needed a pre radiation dental treatment more than one third came under the d or the x somet grading which required an extraction 42% came under the b or c which required prophylaxis and 25% of these population required restoration so the conclusion was dental evaluation before an rt or a ct is absolutely mandatory but the sad thing is that most of the centers in india we don't follow this it's, it's a sad part it may a truth we need to accept it the patient does not go to the tumor board or through the oncology team so each team works separately i think we need to change this practice and then start working as one for the better benefit of the patient when you start working as a team the economic burden on the patient and on the government of the society definitely reduces a lot so we have seen the pre treatment let's quickly go through 
what the role of the dental team is during the cancer, nursing support, dietary modification, because they tend to go into a fluid diet. You need to have a good nursing or a support. Oral hygiene, good brushing, flossing, and alcohol-free mouthwash uh, or chlorhexidine gluconate, either a 0.12% or a 0.2%, the dental caries risk. It is at this stage most of the patients start developing viral infections because the WBC count starts getting down. And mostly we include, we, we, we record herpes labialis or herpes simplex for which a topical and a systemic azyclovir or a valacyclovir is good enough. Fungal infections is very, very common because of an underlying xerostomia which sets in because beyond 26 grays to the parotid region, you go for a, a xerostomia. Either it's a permanent xerostomia or for two to three years, it's a time for the patient to recover back, to come back to a certain level of normalcy. So fungal infections, you need to treat them with topical or systemic antifungals, mainly nystatin or a clotrimazole or a fluconazole. But again, or a myconazole gel. Most of these patients have a coexisting comorbidity. So if your patient is on warfarin or a statin group of drug, postgraduates, remember, do not put them on nystatin, sorry, fluconazole or a myconazole because they can go for a liver failure or a renal failure. So take care. Again, history is very important. See what drugs the patient is taking. An absolute no for fluconazole if the patient is on warfarin and on statin group of drugs. Mucositis starts from the 10th or the 12th day of radiation. You know what the WHO classification of mucositis is, a grade one, a grade two, a, a grade zero, a grade one, a grade two, and a grade three. Treatment of mucositis is one of the most challenging aspects. A wide array of treatment options are available to you. Right from starting the radiotherapy, Talk to your radiation oncologist, be part of the team. If he does not invite, you have a self-invite, you go and speak to him. Put the patient on stents or splints so that the vital structures are spared. There's something called as a cooling therapy, which most of the radiation oncologists will not say. So we oral medicine or oral physicians or dentists can advise the patients to have ice cubes in their mouth when they are undergoing radiotherapy. That reduces the complications a lot. Or you could use radio sensitizers like amifostin or radio protectors, which can reduce. But what happens if mucosite is set in? Topical therapy is what we oral physicians advise. And what's the topical therapy? Benzidamine hydrochloride has got the best effective for radiation mucositis. Chlorhexidine gluconate or does not have as much as of effectiveness or efficacy as compared to a benzidamine hydrochloride. If seven to eight times a patient is asked to gargle in a day till his symptoms start or a local anesthetic patch, lignocaine mouthwashes or lignocaine gels. You could give pentoxifilin, which has got an anti-inflammatory, which has got an angiogenic property, 800 milligrams of pentoxifilin in combination with tocopherol or vitamin A, 1000 international units per day. This combination works very, very effectively then when compared to pentoxifilin alone or most of the tertiary centers nowadays have started giving a drug called as palmifrin, which is an intravenous keratinocyte granulosa stimulating factor, very, very effective to treat mucositis. Xerostomia, I have told you how to treat it. Artificial salary substitutes, pilocarpin or sevimiline. Pilocarpin, I would advise out of my experience to treat it with a medical support because these patients tend to go in for arrhythmias or the cardiac status tends to get alterated. So a five or a 10 milligram of pilocarpin three times a day greatly affects or greatly improves the, the, the salivary component. Denture or obturator. This is one point what you need to advise the patient. Post-surgery, if the patient is on an obturator, mandatorily the patient should not discontinue the obturator for a minimum of six months post-surgery. Even one night, if the patient leaves the obturator out, there is an wound contracture 
and the obturator will not fit properly, complications arise. So stress on the point of a mandatory wearing of the obturator for at least six months. Dietary advice, I've already taught to you. And dental treatment, do not do any invasive dental treatment. It's more of a palliative care, what you're going to do. Coming to the final part of the guidelines, we have seen pre-treatment guidelines. We have seen what we as a dental team need to do during treatment and what happens following cancel treatment post RT and CT. Monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. Every two months or every 15 days or every one month initially for the first six months. Do all his vitals. Look for any recurrence or look for a second primary tumor. This is a typical appearance of how a radiation-induced caries appears, especially in the cervical region or in the, uh, or the incisal surfaces. So do a dental caries risk assessment. Advise fluoride varnishes. Again, the question is when you deal with hematological malignancies, especially in children, what is the dosage of fluoride you need to give? Till about 10 years, you're permitted to give about 1,500 ppm. From 10 to 16 years, you need to give about 3,500 ppm. And it's above 18 years, you go to about 5,000 ppm of fluoride varnishes or toothpaste or a stodium fluoride mouth rinses can be given. Gingival and periodontal risk. Today is the era of hematological stems to HSCT or what you call as hematopoietic, hematopoietic stem cell transfer or a bone marrow transplantation. A lot of patients of following a HSCT or a BMT are on a long term of immunosuppressants, mainly cyclosporin, and that causes a drug-induced gingival enlargement. And with a poor or a compromised periodontal health, you lead to a lot of problems, pain. So monitor the oral health status, especially the patient is on immunosuppressive and immunomodulatory drug. Smoking cessation is very, very important. Comes the role of a public health dentist. Most of these patients, especially what I see in my practice, post-surgery or post-RT or CT, they think that their disease is removed and they can go back because old habits die hard. They can go back to the habits of smoking. Mandatory to stop or absolute cessation. Monitor the blood counts. Treat the herpes labialis. Growth and development, especially if it's a hematological malignancy in children, get compromised. They go for hypoplasia of vital structures like condyle or poor development of the tooth, stunted growth. Orthodontics, as I told you, is a strict no. Discontinue orthodontic treatment before treatment and at least two to three years because the bone architecture gets modified, especially if you are doing an orthodontic treatment in a patient who's about 30 years or, or the second decade. And he gives a history of a hemato-oncological malignancy like a leukemia when he was in the second decade of life go back to the history and see what kind of drugs he was given. Because most of these patients are put on a drug called as bisphosphonates or what we call, or drugs which prevent bone resorption. A complication of bisphosphonates is something called as bronch or bisphosphonate related osteonecrosis of the jaw. They, they permanently change the bone architecture. So if your potential orthodontic patient maybe five years or 10 years down the lane, he was on these group of drugs. The suggestion is that kindly do not venture into uh, orthodontic treatment for these patients. Or, or for, for these patients. So this is a tactical picture of a dryness, in the floor of the mouth, a blanched or a pale tongue, caries, a mucositis, a grade two, and a patient has undergone RT and CT. Oh, radiation fibrosis is another common complication in patients. So the only option available to us is jaw opening exercises, intralesional injections. Pentoxifilin works very, very well in these patients. Pentoxifilin with tocopherol, as I spoke previously, that causes increased angiogenesis or increases the vascularity to a particular site. A minimum of six months you need to give these patients and there is a, a considerable, I won't say things will go back to absolute normalcy, 
but there is a considerable improvement uh, in the level of fibrosis. So this is what I was talking about. And, and either an osteoradionecrosis as a direct sequelae of radiotherapy, if it's more than 50 grays, or what we call as bronze. But most recently from 2014, we have tamed it as m ronge or a medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw, which is because of bisphosphonates, monoclonal antibodies, and anti-angiogenic drugs. Western literature gives a very, very importance to this group of, uh, uh, or this lesion, whereas not much of article is reported from the Indian literature. So a patient reporting with mild mucosal pain, a sudden onset of mobility, or you take a rexa, you find bone changes, suspected to be cause of m -ronge. do not do any invasive dental treatment for these patients. Manage them palliatively with chlorexidine or a clindamycin, and then surgically remove the sequestrum. Sepsis with good antibiotic. Dental implants, yes, if you do, if you're planning for an implant, place the implants during the surgical phase itself and not after RT or CT. And after discharge, it's mandatory that we dentists see them every month to look at the oral changes. My final presentation of the final slide, pain management, palliative care, nociceptive pain in these patients will definitely have to be managed with the help of opioid analgesics like morphine or the more recently fentanyl or the local pain relieving patches, neuropathic pain with gabapentin or carbamazepine, tricyclic, uh, tricyclic antidepressants can be used. Have a psychologist in your part, especially during the first three months or six months so that the patient is made to come out of his anxiety or depression phase. So to conclude my guidelines, oral cancer especially is complex, high chances of recurrence, supportive measures, multidisciplinary team, whichever specialty you are, or even you are a dentist, remember you have a role to finally do the quality of your life, of the patient's life. And thank you all for your patient story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, doctor, for that very informative information. Anyone, anyone would like to ask question to doctor? Right. Hello. Yeah. 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 Ah, Mr. Shofik Mojundar. And uh, hello. Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Sir, uh, my question is that during uh, the cases of radiations, in cases of oral radiations, how yeah. to manage the oral flora during and after that treatment cases? Okay. How, what is the procedure to maintain the oral flora? Okay. This requires a high level of motivation. First is motivation to patients. Before starting, tell them of the possible complications. Don't fear them, but tell them the possible complications which can arise and how the measures to overcome. So before okay. radiation, like constructing of stents or mm -hmm. what, as I told you, cooling of like placing ice cubes during mm -hmm. each cycle of radiation, using mm -hmm. radio sensitizers and protectors, a good oral mm -hmm. hygiene with chlorhexidine, fluoride varnishes, nutritious mm -hmm. diet would definitely reduce the intensity of, I won't say there will not be any complications. Complications mm -hmm. are bound to occur, but you can reduce the intensity mm -hmm. of the complications. Okay. And sir, uh, is there any uh, uses in combination of benzoramine and chlorhexidine gluconate after the means post radiation? Yes, in yes, there is, there, there is, there is a good role. And other mm -hmm. drug, what I, sorry, I will say, thank you for reminding me. What we use in practice is something where we ask the patient to formulate. It's called as a magic mouthwash, where it's a combination of four drugs. Your okay. lignopain, you add a corticosteroid, you add a diphenhydramine malleate, and you add a gelucil or an antacid. This four drug combination in one is to one is to one is to one ratio forms a mucoprotective covering over the mm -hmm. mucosa and the patient has got a lot of uh, uh, effect. The other mm -hmm. drug, what I would suggest to the audience is what the gastroenterologist 
used mm-hmm. for peptic or gastric ulcer. It's called as a sucral fate O. The combination yes, yes. of a proton pump inhibitor with an oxytocaine, which is a local anesthetic. This gives a very good mucoprotective covering to the oral mucosa. Okay, thank you, sir. Any other question? Thank you so much for that question. All right, seems none. Once again, thank you so much, doctor, for sharing your time with us and for that informative presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank you. Next, I would like to welcome our next speaker, Dr. Shashi Rekha Govind. She is currently working as a professor and head of department in Institute of Dental Sciences, Shiksha O Anusandan, Baboneswar, Odisha, India. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Good doctor. evening. Good evening. Thank you. So let me share the my presentation, Please. the PPT. We can now see your PowerPoint. Please have it in presentation mode, Doctor. There you go. Thank yeah. you so much. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Well, by <clears throat> good evening, all. Uh, let's seek God blessing from Lord Ganesh. And good evening, good evening once again. I'm honored and thankful to the entire organizing team of. Uh, IOA and IDA Chennai Metro branch for giving this opportunity to share my knowledge in regarding to oral uh, cancer and happy oral, I can't say it's happy, that's a World Cancer Day. So I am attached to Siksha Onusandan University. It's a, one of the best uh, university uh, globally, as well as one of the first uh, best university in the Eastern India. And we have a lot of uh, collaboration as well as unit for oral cancer, as well as the general cancer. Uh, we have tobacco cessation centers and from DCI, there are a lot of guidelines framed and all of them we are following. And we, in Odisha especially, there is a lot of potential and there is, we have seen the prevalence and incidence of oral cancer is too high in Odisha as compared to other states. Uh, because uh, the general population here, uh, they, they use a lot of tobacco and its variations. So each and almost, I, I can say out of 10 families, uh, five families are facing with oral uh, cancer as well as other form of cancers. So even personally in my own family, I have also experience, experienced and undergone the, uh, the entire traumatic phase in my life. So let us know what are the oral cancer post-therapeutic awareness. Uh, actually, uh, my previous colleague has uh, given in detail regarding this, the etiology, the prevalence and epidemiology of the oral cancer. So me as a, a restorative dentist and endodontist, so I'll be more concentrating on how we can treat uh, the restorative aspect and what are the difficulties we face when we are treating such patients. So he has, he has made me easy uh, uh, in my presentation. Uh, 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 when it comes to what is oral cancer, we all know what it is. He has briefly said, well said and well uh, explained to us. So I'm not going in detail regarding what is oral cancer. So basically we have to understand if there is any kind of non-healing sore or persistent mouth pain is there for the patient. As a clinician, make sure that you are going to refer, if, if you are not able to identify, kindly refer to the specialist so that he will undergo or he will uh, do biopsy and confirm the diagnosis, whether it is a cancer or precancerous lesion or what is the stage of the cancer so that it will be much helpful for the patient. 
So when it comes to treatment of any type of oral cancer, based on uh, one of the classification, we have various forms of uh, oral cancer and most common is squamous cell carcinoma, which is of 90%. And uh, the bacilloid type is worst prognosis as compared to other form of uh, squamous cell carcinoma. And of course, we have other minor salivary gland tumors, soft tissue tumors, lymphoepithelial carcinomas and secondary tumors. So all these are all various forms of oral cancers. But when it comes to treatment of these cancers, I'm not the person and not the specialist oral surgeon to uh, speak about the surgery and all, but just to understand and to know what are the treatment options the surgery is most commonly done that it depends on the extension of the cancer lesion and the duration and what the inf uh, lymph nodes, uh, uh, to what extent it has been involved. So based on that, we can do uh, different types of, and techniques of surgery. So that it's, this is not my forte to explain here. The next is our radiation therapy. So radiation therapy, usually they use certain types of high energy beams as uh, well said by our previous uh, presenter. There are different gradation of radiation uh, based on the extension and the form of uh, cancers. So basically what is this radiation therapy does? So it kills the cancer cells DNA so that it can stop the multiplication of the cells. The next is the targeted therapy. Now in the targeted therapy, basically one specific protein it is going to uh, involve and uh, that protein is basically located on the epidermal growth factor. And the main function of this protein is to, it, in, it helps in uh, cell growth and duplicates. And uh, that's how the, cell, uh, the cells will multiply and the cancer, uh, the lesion is going to grow. So by this targeted therapy, you are going to block that protein so that basic, uh, you will stop the growth or you will reduce, make sure you are going to reduce the, um, cancer, the cancerous lesion. And later on, that can be uh, the surgically, you can treat that or with the help of in combination with surgery or the radiation or chemotherapy, you can go ahead with the treatment aspect. The next is the supportive therapy. This is very, very important, you know. Uh, the supportive therapy, since this as a personal um, experience of mine, uh, where I had the two cancer patients in my, uh, my own family, that's my mother-in-law and my mother, they had the breast cancer. Uh, now I don't have my mother-in-law. She, uh, she passed away uh, nine years back. Uh, so like uh, she had the best breast cancer, well, after six years, there was a recurrence. In the sense, there was a metastasis of the, into the bone. And you won't believe the way uh, she psychologically, she was more down morally, she was down. Not only the patient, even the family, the family, the entire family members will be in depression. They will be psychologically, it's a traumatic condition for each and every one of us. So the supportive therapy, even for the family members, as well as for the cancer patient, both needs. So uh, we need to we need to have or uh, we need to uh, uh, we need to constantly keep in touch with the psychotherapist. So what are the post therapeutic complications? Now the most potential lifelong side effects are like attention, memory, or thinking problems they will have bone, joint, and soft tissue problems, dental problems. Definitely, I'll in the subsequent slides, I'm going to discuss regarding that. Then digestion and swallowing problems, emotional difficulties, then heart problems, they'll have lung problems, hormonal disturbances, lymphadenoma, then the peripheral neuropathy. So all these are all long-term side effects of these treatments. So when it comes to dental problem, the most important is the dry mouth. Now, dry mouth is, it can occur in various stages, okay? Once the radiation or chemotherapy starts, your dry mouth also will start, okay? Along with that, the jaw stiffness or the jaw bone changes might occur, the caries and the loss of tooth structure, especially 
the, during radiation and the chemotherapy, there will be cervical caries, which is most common. Now, why the cervical caries? Why not in other part of the tooth there is caries? Only the cervical caries. And you, you, can, you would have observed that uh, it, it involves only the enamel. Okay. Once it goes to the dentin, it doesn't progress into the dentin. But enamel, it, continuously there is a break of enamel. And the, in the cervical region, the enamel is very thin and it becomes brittle because of the uh, high exposure of the radiation. So that's why the cervical area, it starts breaking out and then the uh, caries will start. Now, why this caries? Again, uh, the patient, uh, the mouth will be very prone to the um, cariogenic bacteria because the patient cannot able to maintain his or her oral length. So that's why the patient will, uh, the, there are more chances of caries to occur in the cervical area. And I'll just tell you the, how we can manage uh, those uh, caries tooth also in the long term. Then loss or change of sen uh, uh, sense of taste. This is very common because of the radiation, because of uh, your chemotherapic drugs, the side effects of the chemotherapic drugs, definitely there is a uh, sense loss in the sense of taste. Because of that, the patient physical health also goes down. So uh, in that way, the, as the previous uh, our colleague said that the nutrition, the diet nutrition is very, very important. His role, he has to monitor, he has to uh, uh, prescribe or uh, advise a, a proper diet chart to the particular patient with particular type of oral cancer. Then painful mouth and gums. The, this is very, very common. Not only with the oral cancers, even with other cancers also, the first problem starts with the mouth pain or the oral pain because they are taking a lot of chemotherapic chemo, uh, uh, therapeutic agents as well as radiations. Because of that, they won't be able to have the proper food and the diet will be definitely hampered. Now, when it comes to uh, oral complication caused by chemotherapy, basically, once the first uh, sitting of the uh, chemotherapy, you won't have much, the patient won't have much problem. But as it progresses, each and every changes is seen in the oral cavity. That is the inflammation of ulcers, mucous membrane, then uh, easy bleeding in the mouth, and there is nerve damage. Now, the nerve damage, again, it depends. So if the lesion is very close to the nerve and you have excised the uh, lesion or you are directly radiating that particular region, so there might be damage of the nerve or the, the patient might not have any sensation in that area. Now, what are the uh, oral complications which is caused by the radiation therapy? As a presenter said that fibrosis, it's, fibrosis is a very common complication. Tooth decay, definitely the patient will have. And this is not that only during the chemotherapy or radiation, the patient will experience tooth decay. This is a long process. Uh, just I would like to uh, give an example here. I have a patient who is uh, constantly visiting me from past five years. She had a, a parotid uh, gland uh, carcinoma. So she had excised it and the surgery and radiation, everything had been done to her. And the one, the left side, both upper and lower, there is constant chipping of uh, enamel is there. Then I have done a lot of restorations and every six months she comes and she gets uh, the restoration replaced. The only thing is what, what is the difference I have uh, seen is the restoration will be intact, but the next to that, the enamel is going to chip off. So in that way, uh, there is a lot of um, uh, sensitivity in that particular area because the dentin is exposed. So now what I have done is now the phase by uh, treatment I'm planning to do to her, that is uh, the first, the upper teeth have given the crowns, the uh, PFM crowns have given so that she will be able to clean that area and as well as she is free of uh, further enamel chipping or uh, the sensitivity. So now she is relieved for the upper uh, segment. Uh, now, the, now I have planned for next uh, plan is for uh, doing to the lower segment, but she is really worried for the sensitivity. They will have, they are very much uh, prone to sensitivity. So that's a main uh, problem or drawback they have. Uh, then comes the breakdown of bone and tissue in the area that receives radiation. So that's what it becomes 
uh, very uh, difficult and the bone changes is too much there. Dry mouth, it's a common thing. So you have to give substitutes for them. Saliva substitutes has to be given. We need to ask the uh, patient to take a lot of uh, water. They should consume, in the, let it be in the form of juice or let it be in the form of whatever they want to. They need to uh, have a lot of uh, water. Then comes our post-therapeutic management. So in post-therapeutic management, so here what I have done is I have divided in, in the uh, like mild symptoms, moderate symptoms, and if, if the patient is having severe symptoms. Now, if the, patient is, if, if the patient is having mild symptoms, so what advices are you going to give? Now, uh, mild symptoms in the sense, just the patient has, been, uh, has done surgery or he, is, he or she is undergoing uh, chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So you need to advise the patient that to keep the mouth clean. Now, how he or she is going to clean the mouth? First of all, the patient is so much psychologically traumatic and he or she will be having so much of pain. So it's always the family members and who are going to support and who are going to instruct and make sure your, uh, your, the patient is going to follow the entire protocol. So you need to ask the patient or the uh, attendees to use a gentle uh, tissue, uh, wipe with the tissue all over the tooth or, as well as the mucosa and make sure it is clean enough so that there won't be any kind of microorganism or that might lead to any a fungal infection or the viral infection. So to, as there will be a lot of uh, dry mouth, so you will have to advise the patient to use water or salivary substitutes or sugar-free gums. So if, if the patient is having soreness in the mouth, so avoid, tell the patient or inform the patient not to use any uh, sharp or crunchy foods or hot or spicy, uh, the uh, food with high acidity, which can irritate uh, the mouth, then sugary foods, so like candies or sodas, so the, uh, that may lead to the cavities, then toothpicks, and definitely the patient avoids uh, all tobacco uh, tobacco or the alcohol drinks. The next is if there is a stiffness of the jaw. So if there is a stiffness, you need to, the basic treatment here will be physiotherapy. You need to ask the patient to open and close uh, two to three times and that he'll repeat per day 20 times he has to repeat and make sure the jaw can be opened uh, in a in moderate way. Okay. So there, are, there was an article um, that's evidence-based management strategy for oral complication from cancer treatment. Uh, this was a, a study which was done by oral care study group and it is published in Inter International Society of Oral Oncology. So they have uh, compiled the entire data and also they have given um, a uh, good uh, explanation regarding each and every complications, the common complications. If anyone uh, wants to uh, go through this uh, article uh, for their further uh, information regarding this, kindly please do that. So I have taken few of, few of their slides here. Uh, so the common complication and their uh, management, which I, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to share with you people. So based on uh, this uh, study, uh, the most common oral complication was uh, bisphosphonate osteonecrosis. Uh, dysgeusia is the loss of taste sensation, then oral fungal infection, then oral viral infection, dental diseases is basically a uh, dental caries, then osteoradionecrosis, then trismus, oral pain, and the xerostomia. Then oral pain, as I said, is very, very common. And when in, the, in their study, they have said that the pain is most common in patients with head and neck. And it is reported that during treatment, 81% they will have, but a 70% at the end of the therapy and 36% at six months post-treatment. Then uh, this is the, just a compiled data of uh, their study where they have divided the entire uh, uh, data into level of evidence, grade of recommendation, then guidelines of classification. So you can go through this table well, it's all, it's all uh, there in your uh, net. So you can always go through this. 
Now, how you are going to manage? The management, the sir has well explained in our previous presentation how to manage the oral pain. But it's, uh, I, I, I'll just say you that it's not so easy, you know. The patient who is suffering from the oral pain, I know I have experienced person, personally. So whatever you are going to give uh, to them, it is just for a, a limited time. Again, the patient will have so much of pain so you feel so, uh, I mean, you will be very, uh, uh, like, emotionally, you will be involved, then you think you won't have any uh, thing to support them, you know, so you will, you will become very helpless in that moment. So, but still, there are few treatments, palliative treatments you can do, that is, you can apply tropical medications for uh, pain, and then uh, you can ask the patient uh, to wipe the mouth or the teeth gently with wet gauze dipped in salt water to remove any pieces of food. And then uh, painkillers like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs you can give, aspirin type painkillers, you can always suggest them. And uh, if uh, chemotherapy, if it is they are going, so chlorexidine mouthwash you can give. Uh, I just, I was going through the literature. The Colgate has uh, one uh, mouthwash uh, that is PerioGuard. So I will, it's, it's a really very good uh, product, you know, where the Colgate has uh, given that. Uh, usually I give uh, the PerioGuard for this, uh, um, uh, these patients, as well as they have a phosphoflora. I'm not going to promote the product, uh, but uh, it's out of my clinical experience, I'm saying that the phosphoflora, it's really good for uh, caries activity, uh, against caries activity and this uh, phosphoflora, uh, PerioGuard is good for the controlling the infection. Then we can always give the sim, uh, zinc supplement uh, to be taken uh, uh, in the mucocystitis cases and uh, povidone iodine mouthwash. That's what I was saying you, even chlorexidine or povidone iodine also can be prescribed to the patient. And uh, if the patient, that's what I said, it's a sensitivity is to the peak they will have. So after chemotherapy, the so fluoride treatment and, of course, GIC can be given to the patient. A layer, thin a layer of GIC coating can be uh, given on to the patient. Uh, I prefer uh, going for a conventional uh, resin uh, a, a conventional GIC than light cure GIC uh, because uh, the conventional GIC has uh, more uh, uh, fluoride exposure as compared to your resin modified GIC. So then later on, once you uh, give a layer, again, you can call back and give a layer of composite on that. Then to relieve pain in teeth grinders, uh, muzzle relaxers can be given and uh, mouth guards uh, while sleeping to wear. Uh, uh, we can always suggest that if the patient is having a lot of pain uh, while sleeping, uh, if the patient is constant bruxer, so you can always uh, give mouth guards to them. Then antifungal oral rinses and antiviral drugs are uh, given to them if depending on what type of cases or what uh, type of surgery they have gone. Now the dental treatment, as I said, it's a, a caris. So in this particular uh, article that is International Society of Oral Oncology, so they have compiled, uh, uh, taking out the many uh, studies which have done, and they have done the review of those things. And uh, then they have uh, given the result and concluded the result that uh, most of the time, uh, the fluoride-based uh, uh, mouthwashers and uh, uh, the toothpaste are uh, prescribed to the uh, patients during the treatment as well as post-treatment uh, for a long time to prevent the dental caries. But it is to one particular level because the radiation uh, uh, is too high that even after giving the fluoride and all those things, the, definitely there will be breakdown of the enamel. So it's better to go ahead with the restorative uh, way of treating the, uh, such cases, again, depending on the condition of the uh, patient. The next is, uh, as I told you, it is an, uh, this, uh, that is impaired uh, sense of taste. So basically by chemotherapy, 
uh, around 56% of patient will ex uh, experience this by radiotherapy 67 combination with radiotherapy and chemotherapy around 76% will have this complication so how we are going to manage this so you have to give zinc gluconate then uh, amosulfitine uh, that can be uh, prescribed to the patient and dietary and education counseling so this is very very important because uh, due to uh, loss of uh, taste the uh, patient won't be able to take or appreciate the food what he is going to take so definitely the physically he'll go down the next is the trismus so uh, the fibrosis or the trismus is most common in patient so just here i'll just uh, share my experience a patient, uh, he had undergone uh, surgery two to three years back for the oral cancer, and he had a lot of pain in the premolar area and the molar area. So that was, uh, that was uh, indicated for root canal. So you won't believe that how much uh, difficult it was for me to do the root canal for that particular patient with the limited opening, but nothing is impossible. Everything is possible. We can do the root canal for that particular patient. So what I did was only thing is we need to modify the instruments. Along with that, we need to use specialized instruments. Now, magnification is very, very important. It doesn't mean that you have to use dental microscope. No, loops, the simple loops is enough. So with the loops and the endomotor uh, here with the hand, you won't believe that my two fingers never used to go inside at all. So I had to use the, my rotary uh, hand piece so it is a small headed rotary and handpiece we need to use and the files we have to bend and modify according to the patient uh, mouth exposure so that's how that's what uh, we will we will be able to manage uh, such patients so nothing is impossible we can always try and modify our treatment protocol as per the patient need so apart from that, we all know there are different ways to release the trismus. This is a general uh, way for the patient, but it's not so simple as seen in the picture for a cancer patient. The oral viral infection, which is very common, okay? It will be very common because the patient won't be able to take care of himself. So somebody else has to be with them or uh, the guided uh, care should be there to the patient. So how we have to do with a simple uh, uh, using antiviral drugs can be recommended to the patient, uh, like around 500 to 1000 milligrams per day. Again, you have to check what kind of uh, uh, treatment or what kind of uh, protocol he has followed during the entire procedure of uh, managing the uh, oral cancer. The oral fungal infection is very, very common than the viral infection because they will be more immunocompromised uh, and uh, they are very, very prone, prone to fungal infection, especially the oral candidiasis. So for that, you have to, again, uh, make sure that topical antifungal agents can be applied like fluconazole, amphotericin. So there are various uh, drugs available so based on the patient weight and the condition, all those things you have to assess and consult with the respective uh, surgeons, and then you can always uh, uh, prescribe uh, these medications. Then this is the most uh, rare uh, form of uh, complication. Uh, this is for uh, like, in, uh, it's basically, it's seen in the oral cavity. There is osteonecrosis of the palate or the bone, it will occur. So how you can manage is you have to remove the, uh, the necrosis part. You have to sequestrectomy has to be done, followed by your uh, chlorexidin mouthwash or uh, any local ointments has to be applied to this uh, uh, particular lesion. And uh, regular monitoring has to be done uh, uh, to assess whether there is an, any a reduction in the size as well as the elimination of the lesion. Then next is uh, the salivary uh, gland hypofunction and xerostomia, which I've already discussed. So what we have to do and in what way we can prevent this.
So there are other uh, treatments, non-drug treatments. So non-drug treatments are first is a physical therapy. Physical is your physiotherapy. So there are uh, based on the uh, severity uh, of the uh, particular post-operative situation, we can, we can always suggest for physical therapy because the muscle contraction, the muscle would have lost its elasticity. The patient won't be able to talk or explain or do his normal activities. So for that, we have to go for uh, physiotherapy. So physiotherapy is very, very important. So along with that, TENS uh, can be done. Then enameloplasty, because uh, why this is important is uh, during the entire after uh, post uh, cancer, uh, the patient, the enamel will become brittle and it tries to break. So that will lead to a sharp uh, tooth. So enameloplasty has to be done. Then massaging, massaging of that area, like applying cold and heat alternatively you can do. Hypnosis is a very good uh, palliative treatment. Then acupuncture, distraction, then relaxing therapy or imaginary cognitive behavioral therapy, music or drama therapy and counseling. So these are the non-drug treatments uh, which can be advised to, the, to such patients. Then when you have a severe symptoms, so in that case, uh, we have to go for uh, obturators as uh, my previous colleague said that uh, it's very, very important uh, for the person or the patient to wear the obturator for a long time. And uh, then uh, full mouth rehabilitation, again, reconstruction, again, it depends on what uh, complete mandibulectomy has been done or uh, the occlusal rehabilitation is very, very important for such patients. Then apart from that, uh, the psychological counseling has to be done and the surgery uh, to be, uh, remove the dead bone or rebuild the bones of the jaws and mouth ha uh, has to be done. And then after that is uh, you have uh, another uh, method that is hyperbarbic uh, oxygen therapy, uh, which will definitely help uh, the wounds to heal. So what are the basic post-therapeutic awareness we have to? Let it be in, in perspective to patient as well as as a clinician. So uh, basic thing is you need to always say the patient before the treatment or during the treatment, how to manage the xerostomia, then don't ignore any signs and symptoms, prevent and minimize the trismus, that is the dentist aspect. Then prevent and treat the dental caries. So as in when the patient is experiencing some amount of sensitivity or uh, caries, so immediately you can uh, treat the patient that to depending on the gradation of the uh, lesion. Then uh, prevent post-radiation osteonecrosis. This is very important. So often the patient needs to go uh, visit the dentist or the, the oncologist and uh, have a regular um, checkup done regarding this and uh, detect the tumor recurrence. This is very important. So you need to take a proper history of the patient, what it is, how it is. And then if there is any recurrence, you need to inform the uh, patient as well as the respective oncologist. Then uh, be careful to eat, uh, it's, uh, eat a well-balanced diet. Topical rinses, gels, creams, and powders are available. So uh, phrase-wise, you need to ask the patient to uh, use all these things and use uh, painkillers as prescribed, then local applications, drink a lot of water, then don't smoke, then don't uh, drink alcohol. I, I know they won't do that, uh, but these things also we need to uh, tell the patient regarding uh, and be aware of all these um, complications. So now what are the hygiene, dental hygiene? Just, uh, just to brief out, uh, regarding the dental hygiene instructions uh, during, after uh, your chemotherapy or radio th radiation therapy is uh, use a, a soft bristle brushes two to three times and make sure the teeth are uh, well cleaned and uh, massage the gum area and use hot water every 15 to 30 seconds uh, so that the, uh, the bristles also has to be uh, soft enough. If it is very hard brush, definitely there will be there is a tendency of uh, bleeding. Uh, bleeding. 
uh, so that's why we need to we need to uh, tell the patient uh, to keep the brushes in the hot water or else we can uh, ask the patient to use the electric brushing because uh, they won't be able to use a normal brush so rinse the mouth two to three times while brushing then avoid rinsing the alcohol uh, based uh, mouthwashes then use mild tasting toothpaste so even fluoridated they say like high concentration uh, uh, toothpaste with uh, different types of uh, taste and all avoid that then uh, then air drying between uh, need to be used then after that flossing has to be done then clean the mouth after every meal that's very important uh, basically again it depends on the patient what is the condition so uh, that's what the attendees or the who are supporters for them they have to follow all these things and use the foam swab to clean the tongue and the roof of the mouth then avoid other things like uh, using using uh, uh, spicy foods hard foods hot foods and drinks so dental visit every 1 to 3 months during the first year then every 2 to 6 months during the second year every 4 to 8 months during the third and fifth year and every year after the fifth year so you need to tell the patient to follow uh, these protocols uh, uh, regarding visiting the dentist so with this i would like to conclude the transition to savior ship is often complex and is different for every person effective coping requires understanding the challenge thinking through solution and asking for support volunteering and spreading awareness makes an important difference in someone else's life while making a positive difference in your own with this i would like to conclude and thank you very much this is my contact details so once again it's my honor to be a part of this webinar hope i have exchanged my knowledge to all uh, globally thank you thank you very much over to you good evening i welcome you all to this free webinar on gas thank you i would like to welcome to our next speech Keynote speaker Dr. Homan Soleimani Ma. He is currently working as a consultant gynecology oncology surgeon in Churchill Cancer Center, Oxford University Hospital, NHS Foundation Trust, Headington, Oxford, United Kingdom. That operates under the Technoid Group. Welcome, sir. Hello. Um. Many many thanks for. your kind introduction um i'm extremely grateful just kindly let me know whether you could see my presentation so world yeah we see it you you could and and just kindly let me know whether you could hear my voice clear fantastic and 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 i i could hear some background uh, talk I wonder whether you could kindly ask um, our audience to mute um if by any chance it's possible so um I think my the quality of my internet is is good hopefully I should be able to take you through the presentation if you're happy I start Can I start Hello Yes sir you may start Yes So um uh, my, I mean thank you very much for your kind introduction it is an absolute honor to be here and to be able to share with you the dichotomy of laparoscopy versus laparotomy in the post lac era um I would like to just take you through the background we know that radical hysterectomy with pelvic lymph node dissection is a standard care for early stage cervical cancer and prior to 2018 the nccn and the european society of gynecology oncology guidelines suggested that it was acceptable 
to perform radical hysterectomy in patients with earlier stage cervical cancer, either by laparotomy or by minimal access approach, which could have been laparoscopy or robotic. And these recommendations led to widespread use of minimal access surgery, despite a paucity of adequately powered prospective randomized controlled trials evaluating the survival outcomes. But unfortunately, the world, even though the world was at peace with minimally invasive radical hysterectomy for earlier stage cervical cancer, but in March 2018, we heard and we witnessed and we were faced, we faced the tsunami of black trial. Just quickly and briefly about the LAC trial. A LAC trial is a laparoscopic approach for the management of cervical cancer. This is a phase three multi-center randomized controlled trial, which had the primary objective to test the hypothesis that minimal access surgery was not inferior to open radical hysterectomy in terms of percentage of patients who were disease-free at four and a half years post-surgery. And the secondary objectives compared were recurrence rate and overall survival. In LAC studies, which has changed since then the management of cervical cancer, there were 33 centers worldwide. There were 631 people recruited from June 2008 to 2017. And eligible participants were women aged 18 years of age or older with FIGO stage 1A with lymphovascular space invasion, stage 1A2 or 1B1, 1B1 adenocarcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, adenosquamous with the performance status of zero to one, who were listed to have either, or subjected to have either type one or type three radical hysterectomy. There were two arms. In the open arm, there were 312 patients recruited, and in minimal access surgery group, 319 patients were recruited. The outcome of the LAC trial showed that the death occurred in 19 of, out of 319 patients in the minimal access surgery group, out of 312 patients in the open surgery group, and the death from the cervical cancer itself occurred in 14 out of 319 patients in minimal access group, and that was versus two out of 312 patients in open surgery. The local regional recurrences happened in 18 out of 319 patients in minimal access versus four out of 312 patients in the open surgery group. And of course, there was a global response to the lack of time. And the question was, how should gynecology colleagues react to expected results of the lack of time? I would be very grateful if our colleague could just mute the microphone. Um, so how should gynecological oncological react to this unexpected results? Yes. Since the publication of the LAC trial, there have been 126 black related papers published. And why has this trial polarized clinicians so much? And we would like to know what are the issues. The reason so for that is prior to the LAC trial, we did have another method of outcome. We did have very robust and solid evidence coming from the management of uterine cancer. And that was lap to a study which showed that surgical staging of the uterine cancer is feasible through the minimal access surgery in terms of short-term outcomes and results in fewer complications. Then we had further follow-up for the lap two, which again showed that Laparoscopic surgical management of uterine cancer is superior to for short-term safety and length of hospital stay, of course, but the potential for increased risk of cancer recurrence from with laparoscopy versus laparotomy was quantified and found to be small, and they were very similar. So there was already a very solid evidence that the management of uterine cancer with the laparoscopic 
approach is safe, but that was um, very difficult to digest. Why would that be different when it came to the management of cervical cancer? Now, there has been a lot of criticism of the LAC trial and the pitfalls. There are questions about the surgical proficiency, skill set, surgical radicality, of course, the information about the parametrium, the type of hysterectomy, was it type two, was it type three, people Rutledge Smith, what type of operation they had, surgical quality, and of course, lack of subgroup analysis. This surgical proficiency, of course, is very important. This should be considered the most important issue of any surgical trial. Randomization avoids bias in recruiting patients, but does not compensate for the difference in surgical proficiency. Acceptance of the LAC trial results assumes that all surgeons were equally competent in the laparoscopic and open approaches. However, some surgeons had not completed a fellowship in gynecological oncological field. Others were general surgeons with a surgical oncological fellowship. The technical nuances of a well-performed radical hysterectomy cannot be acquired without sort of specialized training. So these are the criticism. Skill set issues and some unanswered questions like there were only 45 patients who had robotic operations. The surgeon proficiency criteria for minimal access in the LAC trial was on the basis of 10 cases a year. Most studies agree this requires at least more than 40 to 50 a year. The adequacy of the laparoscopic radical hysterectomy was subject and based on a review of two unedited videos of only type three supplied by each surgeon to the trial management committee and also did each of its four members review each of the videos? These are the questions to be answered. Was there unanimous agreement? Was there anything collective you were sought? How many videos were submitted but not accepted as adequate because of the lack of radicality? What about the parametrium? Parametrium is the surrogate marker of surgical radicality when it comes to the management of cervical cancer. I think that is quite globally accepted among the gynecological oncological surgeons. The size of the parametrium would decide whether the surgery was radical or not. However, in the LAC trial, parametrium measurements were not measured. Why was the Kerala Moro classification was not used, which was published in 2008, and we all used the Piva Rutledge Smith classification, which was published in 1974. So the type of hysterectomy was also questioned. The laparoscopic radical hysterectomy included type two and type three, and the choice was left to the operating surgeon. There were no protocol guidelines indicating which type of surgery should be performed for which tumor size without preoperative magnetic resonance imaging measurement or MRI, which is more accurate than visual estimate. There are no results provided for each type. And we do not know the criteria considered by each surgeon for each type. What about the surgical quality? The exact locations of these recurrences is not specified, where the peritoneal spread, lymph nodes, or port sites, or others. The methods used to avoid a spread during the surgery remain unanswered. The use of intrauterine manipulator, which in many, many gynecological oncological settings and hospitals are banned because of the risk of lymphovascular space invasion and the tumor spread, early closure of vagina, which is consistent with oncological hygiene. What about measures to prevent intraperitoneal spillage? Many platers, if the vagina is cut in the pelvic cavity, broken tumor fragments may flow in the pelvic and abdominal cavity and cause peritoneal seedings and, 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 and disseminated carcinomatosis. Because the patient has a steep trend limbic down, and we know that uh, there's a tumor spillage and the CO2 is, is, is on and, and the risk of, of course, widespread disease. What about the subgroup analysis? What about the other unanswered questions? All recurrences were cl clustered in 14 of the 33 participating centers. Was this due to the number of patients entered at each center? The wrong type of radical hysterectomy performed for the tumor size? The expertise of the surgeon in the laparoscopic radical hysterectomy was different, all above. So many critics feel the subgroup analysis should be performed to determine which group has higher recurrence rate and explore the reasons for that. Tumor size, stage, histology, the tumor biology, the surgery type, and the surgeon's experience. After LAC trial, some critics have suggested designing another prospective randomized control trial. 
a single pathologist review perhaps, preoperative MRI, parametrial measurement, quality indicators of radical hysterectomy, unified criteria for the performance of type B or type C2 or 3 radical hysterectomy, performance by gynecological oncological surgeon with subspeciality training, subspeciality board certification or with published results of their radical hysterectomy data. And do we need longer follow-up period? Now, there has been many, many papers published since the publication of LAC trial, and we know they're all very consistent when it comes to the survival outcome. The LAC group themselves have um, done a great job in terms of publishing other surrogate markers of morbidities and also quality of life. They published a paper on the quality of life in the Lancet Oncology on the patients they have recruited previously in the LAC trial, and they found the quality of life was quite uh, similar in both laparoscopy and laparotomy. They, they found no difference um, when they did the statistical analysis. They also went on to look at the incidence of adverse events in minimally invasive versus open radical hysterectomy in early stage cervical cancer, results of a randomized controlled trial. They also found there was not huge difference between the two. There has been a lot of papers published and a lot of colleagues around the globe, including Europe, trying to put the data together to see whether the findings are consistent with the LAC trial. The soccer study published by the multi cooperative uh, group in Europe and very known by oncologists have shown that the minimal, minimally invasive surgery in cervical cancer increased the risk of relapse and death compared with open surgery. This is consistent with the LAC findings. In this study, avoiding the uterine manipulator and using maneuvers to avoid tumor spillage, which is consistent again with the oncological hygiene, is paramount, especially at the time of colpotomy in minimally invasive surgery. So there have been more papers and the papers are coming one after the other. Again, some authors of the um, LAC trial publish and, and look at the trachelectomy, for example, open versus minimally invasive radical trachelectomy in earlier stage. And they have found no difference. Again, this is not a randomized controlled trial, but it's a very well structured collection of 646 patients who have had trachelectomies in both arms. What about the guidelines? So we are supposed to be following guidelines. I mean, the cervical cancer guideline published by European Society of Gynecology Oncology also the guideline published by British Society of Gynecology, Oncological Cancer, and also the NICE guideline in United Kingdom now recommends that the clinicians should ex exercise caution when it comes to the management of this patient. And perhaps they need to change the practice. And since then we have moved on to treat these women with laparotomy because that what is supposed to be happening when we have the level A evidence and also um, that should be happening when we have very solid governance and also we need to be patients advocate. But that does not stop us to critically appraising the trial which is published, but that's what we have been doing. And for any tumors less than two centimeters, if we want to undertake um, laparoscopy, then we have to recruit those patients as, as part of the trial. Now, it's not just us, by the way, who are facing this. There are many, many, many other specialities are doing randomized control trial to see whether laparoscopy is better than laparotomy. I would just like to draw your attention to the laparoscopic, on the left-hand side, laparoscopic assisted versus open sophagectomy, for example, of patients with esophageal cancer. So it's a protocol for randomized control trial because other surgeons like upper GI surgeon or hepatobiliary surgeon would like to get the same answer. In the middle, we have another study called LAPOP study, which is the laparoscopic versus open distal pancreastectomy, a study protocol for single center, non blinded randomized control trial. And there is another trial on the right hand side, laparoscopy versus open gastrectomy, uh, a multi center randomized control trial. So it's not just us who, for many years, felt laparoscopy is the way forward, but now we're challenged by very high quality prospective studies in all the specialities. So I think, we think that in the United Kingdom, it's very unlikely that there will be another RCT, at least in Europe, to repeat the same trial because of the hazard ratios, which was noted in LAC trial. I mean, we came to conclusion, they came to conclusion that there's a six times more chance that you might die having a laparoscopy when uh, you have cervical cancer. 
there's still many unanswered questions, including uh, like what we do with the patients who need trachelectomies, what about lymphoid dissection after hysterectomy for undiagnosed cervical cancer. These are the situations we face on a weekly basis in our gynecology oncology MDT in Oxford, laparoscopic pelvic and pyrotid lymph node dissection for potentially positive lymph nodes um, to avoid um, whole body PET CT scan or laparoscopy hysterectomy for uterine cancer when we have cervical involvement. What about those patients? even though we have had the studies proven to be safe, like lab two trial and lab two follow-up. So um, in conclusion, um, even though it seems to be sad that we don't or we can't do laparoscopy for cervical cancer, but my message is, as you can see on both pictures on the left and right side, we are able to provide um, a safe, surgical and oncological outcome for our patients, regardless of the route, we as clinicians should be able to face uh, the truth when we are presented with the randomized controlled trial. That should not uh, stop us to critically appraising the findings and trying to maneuver with evidence and, and continue to do so. And that's not just applied to the cervical cancer or any patients we treat or operate. And also I would like to say that even though the ego of the surgeons are very important and, and we do like to um, do what we like, and, and, but we need to be very understanding that the, the key to succeed is a very solid clinical governance in place. We have to make sure that we put our patients first and, and not our own agenda. I think um, the LAC trial, which came, I said at the beginning, came as a tsunami in, in gynae oncology world and has changed many things, has made us think every day what we do, do we have a solid evidence and also continue to look for um, evidence and make sure that whatever we do, we exercise clinical evidence-based medicine and we make sure that our patients are at the center of what we do and share with them very truthfully and with utmost transparency about what is coming in the literature and try to support them and, and also look after them, not short term, but also long term, because ultimately we want to make sure our assessment of our patients are holistic and we look at their survival and quality of life, short term and long term. Thank you very much for having me. Back to you. Thank you for that, sir. On behalf of IAO and IDA, I heartily thank all of the delegates and students who have joined today. Thank you all for participating in our webinar. Stay tuned with us for more updates regarding the IAO webinar and conferences. You can download your e-certificate on our AA. IAO dashboard. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.